many people, they absolutely are. And if you work for British Airways, for example, um, I think, I think, and, and many other people who've been victims of the so-called gig economy, um, I think there will have been times over the past few years when, when you've actually been quite grateful for being a member of a trade union. But when I was growing up in the in the seventies, I mean, it was as if the trade unions were part of the government of the country. And then after Margaret Thatcher's trade union reforms, obviously the power diminished, the membership has gone down, although there has been, I think, a slight revival in the last couple of years. So um, we, we've had uh, quite a few trade unions on in the last year. Dave Ward from the Communications Workers Union, he comes in reasonably regularly. Uh, we've had the new leader of the uh, of Unison in, and we did the debate uh, between the different leadership candidates, or most of them, for the Unite General Secretaryship. So I thought we'd do something different today. We've got Frances O'Grady with us, somebody who you hear a lot on LBC. She's the General Secretary of the TUC, and she's going to be taking your calls over the next hour. And and of course, the number to call 0345 6060 973. Um, Francis, welcome. Have you done a phone in before? No. <laughs> you've, been, you've been General Secretary for 10 years and no one's invited you to. You see that? No, listen, thank you for that invitation. Um, I'm looking forward to it, I think. Well, yeah, most people do, they think, but it, it usually goes okay. Just, look, let's get back to basics because I think. There will be people listening who think, well, what is the TUC? What, what does it actually do? And what does your role involve as General Secretary? So let's start from the basics of the job. So the TUC is the umbrella organisation for unions in Britain. We're the unions union. We've got nearly 50 of them. And um, as you quite rightly said, our membership is growing. And it's been growing over the pandemic. But for the last four years, we've seen people turning to unions because they're fed up with not having real pay increases. They want to feel safe at work. They want learning and education opportunities. They want a voice, and that's what unions are there for, for working people on the, sh on the ground, all walks of life, from footballers to factory workers, actors, teachers, you name it, nurses, uh, we represent them. And, and just to say, I'm not at all complacent about our membership because apart from anything else, our chances of winning a better deal for working people depend on growing and being stronger. That's, that's what makes us strong. But on the other hand, I'm always conscious that the trade union movement is the only movement that's described in Britain as, uh, you know, where its relevance is questioned. Well, we've got nearly six million working people in membership. That's a big democratic movement. And that's what, 20% of the workforce? And we're growing and we've got to grow for sure. But I think I think a lot of people are seeing the difference that unions can make because in the end, you know, unlike governments, we're tested every day of the week. Uh, you know, if we're not winning for working people, then what's the point? So, Do, Does it frustrate you that your, your predecessors back in the 70s and early 80s kind of gave the union movement a bit of a bad name and, and therefore the influence of the union of individual unions and indeed the collective uh, TUC is less than it might have been had that not happened. Well, I, I was, even I was only a teenager in the 70s. Well, me too. And uh, <laughs> I also, you know, I also like to remind people that, of course, the 70s was Britain's most equal decade uh, in terms of the gap between the top and everybody else. And it was also officially our happiest decade. Was it? Yeah, uh, according to uh, official analysis. So, you know... I'd love I, to know what the definition was oh, then. I guess, well, we all have different views on fashion and music, <laughs> but I, I think there was something about um, people feeling like they had a bit of dignity on the job, that they would be listened to, that if... If, you know, for the most part, unions are doing deals with employers week in, week out, and we have good relationships in motor manufacturing, all sorts of areas. Uh, but when an employer does something that is unfair and refuses to compromise, then it's important for working people to stick together. And that's the only way you'll get that fair treatment you deserve. Is it the Trades Union Congress yes. or the Trade Union Yeah, because there's more than one. Right, okay, because I, I think I always say the Trade Union Congress. Um, are you associated with the Labour Party? The TUC is not affiliated, but I never hide the fact that obviously our history is mm. that we were a key player in creating the Labour Party because, you know, way back then, people realised that, uh, 
yeah, of course we could make a difference for working people, but we also needed working people to be represented in Parliament. And of course they weren't. And I, I've, uh, I've just been writing a little piece about Margaret Bonfield, who yes. was the first female cabinet yes. minister in this country That's in true. 1929. Yeah. And of course she grew up in a very poor family um she eventually became i can't remember the name of the union but it was a sort of retail related Shop workers uh, union, yeah. yeah um and, and then went on to become um a, 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 a labor cabinet minister and i think people's traditional view of unions is that they, they that most of the members are men I mean, and, and probably that was the case in the past, but it's interesting that women have always been able to always sort of break through. And that they're, women. They're always have been, <laughs> I think I'm right in saying, always have been female trade union leaders. I mean, I remember Brenda Dean, leader of SOGAP back in, back in the day. Yeah. And of course, you then became the first female general secretary of the TUC, and that was seen as a bit of a breakthrough. It was. It took, you know, we didn't rush it, did we? But <laughs> um, so, and, I, and I'm so pleased to see kind of women leaders of our biggest unions now unite. Yeah, they're all women, and, aren't they, more or um, less? Well, not no, enough. So We're still not there, but my goodness me, progress has been made. And that's only right because over half of our membership is women. And I'm a great believer see, that, I didn't know that. that, you know, we should be representing people in all walks of life. And we should make sure that we look like the workforce we aim to organise. So, you know, it's it's a, a real boost to me to see more women taking their place in leadership at every level, not just at, you know, general secretaries, but reps in the workplace. Absolutely critical for us too. We, we've talked um, in the recent past about the role, uh, your role in the pandemic, where y you've probably been closer to government than you have been well, ever since you've taken on the job. What's it been like working with government during the pandemic, trying to get the, the right things happening? Have they listened to you in the way that you would have wanted them to? Well, it wasn't just me, you know, and I re I'm very conscious that uh, nobody would be talking to me if it wasn't that I'm there to represent mm. uh, the trade union movement and working people. But, um, you know, I think I think this was a decision, if you like, of our elected body, the general council, our executive, that that we had to step up during the pandemic. This was a national crisis. Nobody knew, if you remember at the beginning, nope, none of us knew where this was going to lead or just how bad it was going to be, uh, that we were representing key workers in the NHS, in education, posters, you know, people who were carrying on going to work uh, engineers in our energy system you know critical services for the country that we had to get the health and safety right to make sure that people were safe and critically that we couldn't just see a return and you know this might this is my personal memory of the 80s uh, is mass unemployment and the damage that did and so our top priority was we've got to protect lives and livelihoods and we rolled our sleeves up together I think not and not just the leadership this was you know like I say health and safety reps across the country doing incredible work. Are you surprised at how well the employment figures have held up because apparently there are, there are now I think nearly as many people employed as there were at the start of the pandemic inflation sorry unemployment is 4.1 percent which is only 0.2 percent more than it was at the beginning i think i think most of us i mean a lot of economists were predicting 10 percent unemployment weren't they this was my top line argument with rishi sunak uh, when i first spoke to him over the phone was you know that this isn't just about protecting families from unemployment important though that is this is about the economy being able to bounce back faster mm. and all the evidence because again people don't always know that we're part of an international movement so we have ready access to exactly what's going on in other countries and can learn from their successes and mistakes uh, furlough schemes in other countries were you know a proven way to ensure that firms didn't go under, good jobs didn't go under, and just as importantly, that you could uh, get back on the saddle quickly. Uh, so, you know, so yeah, I, I feel proud of the union movement for having done that. It wasn't perfect. We didn't get everything we wanted, but my goodness me, one in three of the workforce, you know, at its peak. Did you ever think that a Conservative government would intervene in the way that it did? Because it was all done quite quickly, wasn't it? It was done very quickly and very intensively. Um, you know, a lot of phone calls, a lot of um, meetings, and including in the in the Treasury. I think. 
if I'm honest, I said at the time I did give credit to the Chancellor um, that he was open. You know, he, was, he wasn't prejudiced against if he, if he could see a good idea, he was prepared to pick it up. We'd published a report. I spoke to him within hours, I think, of publication of that. Uh, we literally went through it page by page um, and then had a series of meetings and so on afterwards. Uh, so I did give credit to him at the time. I have to say I'm disappointed that uh, maybe we're not getting the same hearing on some of our ideas for what happens next, because I think this transition period, which we all hope it is from pandemic to endemic, is still going to be tricky, still going to be volatile. People will still be, I know, people are still feeling very insecure, worried about the future. And I think the trade union movement has got some great ideas to steer us through this next stage, hopefully to good green growth with decent jobs. Well, that's going to be, I think, the final question from me. You're going to get much more difficult questions from our callers. <laughs> uh, they're coming up in a moment. 0345 6060 973. If you'd like to talk to Francis, you might want to talk about fire and rehire. It's something that we've talked about mm. a lot on the programme over the years. But what do you want to see, not just from the TUC, but from individual trade unions in general? 0345 6060 973. It's quarter past eight. This is LBC. This Ian Dale on LBC. It's 18 minutes past eight on LBC. Um, I, somebody wants to ask me a question on unions. They want to know what... Um, <laughs> Which union Bill you're in? Says, yeah, well, what <laughs> union are you in, Ian? Well, believe it or not, when I first started out in journalism, I was a member of the National Union of Journalists. And so you should be. I was. Uh, let's sign you up again. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, you should join. You should join. Should I? Okay, yeah, well, brilliant we'll union. We'll Another to... brilliant woman leader, by we'll, the way. We'll Michelle go, Stanistry. We'll have to see how you can whip me into line. And <laughs> going back to the previous discussion that we had in the in the last hour. Right, let's go to your calls. Ben is in Haringey. Hello, Ben. Hello, Ian. Hi. Yes, um, I wanted to ask her uh, how how can the trade union um, uh, membership be improved uh, and bring it back to as uh, a level it was uh, before what, in the old days? What was the highest membership? Was it about 12 th- million, I something like so- that? It is, but we're sort of comparing apples and pears because, of course, we didn't have to keep membership records and report and account in quite the same way we do Mm. now because we're very tightly regulated. But without doubt, Ben is right. We've got to rebuild. And, uh, you know, many of our unions, we've uh, been running some important organising campaigns, including in some of those new areas of work. You know, you've seen what unions have done in terms of Uber, Um, uh, a lot of the gig uh, employers uh, we're we're working really hard to bring into membership because we've got to make sure that we stop some of the exploitation that we've seen the bogus self-employment the zero hours the low pay Um, but there are plenty of other areas as well you know I want software engineers I want Google employees to join I want you know, to make sure that we're keeping pace with the modern world of work. Do you, do you find that the old image of unions still sort of is, is a bit of a um, dead weight for you? Because when we've when I've spoken to Dave Ward about why people should join his union, he, he says, well, look, people imagine that we're always on strike, that we want outlandish pay rises. What they don't get is all of the other benefits that they get from joining a union, all the other things that we provide for them. Um, and, and nobody really ever talks about those. And I, I think we've got to do a much better job of explaining to people the difference it makes. Uh, the evidence is very clear that if you are organised in a union, you're much more likely to get better pay, better health and safety, better training opportunities, work-life balance. You know, it, it's all set out in black and white the evidence is there but maybe we're not getting that message across and the other thing we always teach our organizers as well is that we have to listen more you know including the likes of me a little less gobby a bit more listening I to why it is <laughs> why it is what it is at work that people want to change and it's amazing when you do listen to people it, you know, it's not always what you think it is. So mm. it's not always about pay, important though that is. It's very often about a bit of flexibility at work, a bit more respect, people worried about bullying, all sorts of issues that people want to see changed and can change it if they join together well, in ju- the Just related to Ben's call, Peter in Guildford has sent in a text. If you want to do that, by the way, you can do so, 84850. Uh, could I ask Francis what's been done to launch a campaign to increase union membership? Well, that's similar to Ben's question. He says, trade unions are essential in order for us to have a civilised society, and therefore I feel they need to have a massive membership drive to make people aware of their rights and campaign against zero-hours contracts and the gross inequality in this country. I have a lot of respect for Francis because she seems to genuinely want a fairer society Society. Also, in the light of a Tory MP crossing the floor to Labour, does she think that Labour should let Mr Corbyn, a socialist, back in as a Labour MP? Are you yeah, going well, to dodge that one? I, I'm not here to speak for the Labour <laughs> Party. I, w- I, w- no, wouldn't want, for yourself. I wouldn't want them telling me what to do with t- the TUC's rules and how we apply those, and I don't think it's right I comment on that. What I do know is I think, you know, Labour is always going to be a broad church, And maybe Labour needs to concentrate a bit more on what people have in common rather than the differences, just like in any other part of our lives. But Peter, Peter, I think, has a good point here, because I don't remember, maybe uh, maybe these campaigns wouldn't be directed to me, but I don't remember a great billboard campaign, for example, saying, join your union, this is what you get out of it. Isn't that the sort of thing that you need to do, a real nationally expensive post a billboard campaign I'm up for that and I, th- I, I have also lots think of we need which I'm sure they'd be happy to sell you yeah and look at what we were doing over the pandemic again uh, like everybody else we had to go big time online uh, you know we, our high point was one of our unions holding a zoom meeting with half a million people on it that must have cost a bit 
<laughs> no, it didn't. That's the half point. Half a million. Half a million people, nearly half a million people on a single call. Now, I think we've got to find new ways to organise. Uh, but I also believe there's no substitute in the end for face to face and the recommendation coming from other workers. So, you know, all of us have got to be organisers. So we've got to do our bit. Um, and I, I agree with you, you know, if we do a major publicity drive, uh, I'm up for that. Um, I'm up for doing more on digital, but it's also like all of us taking that responsibility to sign up our family, sign up our workmates. And, you know, that's the way we win a fair deal. And as you mentioned, fire and rehire, zero hours, bogus self-employment. There's an, And it's not just, by the way, not just delivery drivers. We've seen that spread in mm. areas that surprised me, like, uh, you know, okay, education well, we, we, and so on. We so might get a call on it. that. So um, let's, uh, Ben, thank you for that. Let's go to Michael in Ellesmere in Shropshire. Hello, Michael. Uh, hi, Ian. Thank you hi. for having me. Um, yes, um, I'd like to ask about uh, foreign labour and immigration, if the union has something to do with it. Um, some people think that foreigners might undermine the labour market, could, like the union kind of swoop in and ensure that they have good conditions uh, so that, you know, British people don't get undermined, so that, like, some sharp businesses don't get people in who work for £4 an hour. Uh, because I believe if if everyone had good conditions, then British people wouldn't be undermined and the labour market wouldn't suffer through immigration. Well, Michael, I'm with you. I I think, you know, our starting point as a trade union movement is it doesn't matter where you come from, what your background is, what your race or religion is, everybody should be entitled to decency and dignity at work. And that's our best defence. Um, because I tell you, if employers can't find cheap labour from overseas, then they'll find cheap labour from young workers or, as we've seen, unequal pay for women workers. You know, the bad employer will always try and find cheap labour. So our best defence is our own organisation. But we also need fair laws. You know, if I, I, we've been going on about zero hours and fire and rehire till we're blue in the face, when are we going to get the minimum standards that a government should introduce to make sure that the decent employer isn't undercut by but the that, bad as much as dignity I mean, there are workers. a lot of laws that do protect people, but it seems to me that they're not being implemented. You look at you look at the number of prosecutions over the years. I think there have been more recently, but the minimum wage came in in 1998. I think by 2012 there have been two prosecutions. And you think, well, how can that be? And then we see these sweatshops in Leicester, we which, know it's going which were exposed in the pandemic. Now, you think, well, if, if the government aren't rooting these out, which you think, well, that is part of the government's role to do, isn't that something that you ought to be... I mean, you, exactly trade unions so. must have known that these were going on. Why, why is nothing being done? It was trade unions that exposed them. And, you know, same in Sports Direct. Nobody would have known about what was going on inside Sports Direct if, or Amazon if it wasn't for trade unions, frankly. So, um, but... I absolutely agree. Rights, individual rights, aren't worth the paper they've written on unless you've got strong trade unions to enforce them and a strong wages inspectorate and health and safety inspectors. But you also need, um, you know, you need a deterrent. And if people feel they can get away with flouting the law... The bad ones will. But, I mean, so the, these last know, aspects, I'm sorry to concentrate yeah, yeah. on those, but those are the ones that were in the news last year. But there must have been workers there who blew the whistle, but nothing was done about it. I mean, I don't, don't even know if they've all been closed down now. Well, you take health and safety during this pandemic. We have been knocking on the door of government constantly with photos, uh, evidence, uh, testimonies, and yet only one prosecution of one employer for flouting the COVID safety rules over the whole pandemic. How can that be? Well, one reason is health and safety inspectors massively cut uh, the budget of the health. We got a bit more money for them. We campaigned for that. But, you know, the budget of the health and safety executive massively cut. And I think almost the confidence about how you're expected to go about enforcing the law was too low. And, 
you know, a, a signal from the government that actually what goes on inside workplaces is just as important as what goes on in people's backyards. <laughs> oh, bi- biting political satire. <laughs> well, there. you know, I would I would have liked the. Some, you know, I, I know when I was going for walks, there were police on horsebacks moving people off park benches, you know, and yet inside workplaces, it was kind mm. of Wild West. Mm. Why? Uh, and and that was a real, that wasn't just about individual health and safety. That was about a public health threat where people were getting infected because there was no social distancing, no masks, no proper PPE, and taking it home on the bus and home to their families. OK, Michael, thank you very much for your call. Uh, we'll take more of your calls in a moment with Francis O'Grady, General Secretary of the TUC. It's half past eight on LBC. Here are the latest news headlines with Lottie Morley. A Conservative MP claims Tory rebels are facing blackmail and intimidation from government ministers. The Prime Minister says he's seen no evidence of the tactics being used to encourage backbenchers to support him. Joe Biden has revised comments which suggested a low-level Russian attack on Ukraine would be tolerated. Following criticism, the US president has clarified any military action would lead to a response. Two men have been arrested in Birmingham and Manchester as part of an investigation into an armed attack on a Texas synagogue. US officials shot a 44-year-old from Blackburn in Lancashire dead following a 10-hour standoff on Saturday. LBC weather, dry and clear for most tonight. Some drizzle in the far north of Scotland, a low of minus four. This is LBC. Dale on LBC. Text 84850.
8.33, we have an anonymous text here. Do put, do put your first name on a text, it always helps. Uh, saying, good luck, Francis. With your attitude and outlook, I think you can make a huge difference in revolutionising the image of unions, something I've always been against. But <laughs> you are refreshing. As Ian says, you need a communications and catchy marketing strategy to push and promote what you are about. Stronger together for a fairer future for all. Well, there's a oh. good slogan for you. <laughs> you haven't even had to pay for that exactly, one. Exactly, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> right, it. let's go back to your calls. Um, 0345 6060973. Uh, Robin is in Corby. Uh, hello, Robin. Hi, Ian and Francis. How are you? Very uh, well. Very well. Hi, yeah. Yeah, good, good. I set up, uh, well, I went through the courts and set up a union for foster carers because foster carers very often feel victimised and abused a little bit by social services, although they do a very good job looking after children who have come from lots of good circumstances. Now, I need to know, or I need some help, with how to make foster carers feel as though they're not going to be victimised if the social services that they work for suddenly find that they've joined our union. Because a lot of them are, are, are very, well, well, very fine. We've had that intimated several times. We don't want to use, join a union or an association run for foster carers or anything like that, because if the social services or the agency we work for finds out, they're going to discriminate against us. Mm. So that's the ball's in your court now. Explain how we're going to do that. <laughs> well, Robin, first of all, it would be completely against the law if anybody was victimising, victimised for exercising their right to join a union because that is a right that all of us have. But I understand that, you know, people can sometimes feel worried um, that it, you know, uh, they'd be marked down even if they weren't sacked, as it were. Uh, so another way that we kind of approach this is about getting agreements with the agencies, the authorities, that it you know encourages people to exercise their rights and recognise the union for discussions about the issues that their members care about. Uh, so I think that's why we're always looking to get agreements with employers, but also, you know, agencies and authorities as well. We do what we call framework agreements, big agreements, like when we had the Olympics, we had a framework agreement with um, the uh, uh, Olympic develop uh, delivery authority, the mayor, and so on, so that everybody would send that signal together that it's a good thing to be in a union and we're setting minimum standards for how working people should be treated. Robin? Well, we've contacted the local authorities and some agencies for different members' problems, and once we explain to them that we are a proper trade union set up by the certification officer and the courts, they do sit up and pay attention. Mm. And it, we, it's managed to resolve quite a lot of problems by simply our members copying us, in, copying us into an email they've sent to the local authority. Suddenly yeah. the problem vanishes. It's a miracle. Yeah, um, well done. But the only, the only local authority that's actually endorsed us is Cheshire East. Mm. Now, Cheshire East local authority, they put out... Um, a memo to all their foster carers to say you don't have to join this union but it's here it's been set up to to protect you and mediate between you and us if there's a problem so if you'd like to join please do so yeah. we've got quite a few members from that and we've tried uh, as i say mailing out to agencies and, and and local authorities and whatever and saying hello we're here we're not going to bite you we're here to try and solve any problems that might turn up um please tell your foster carers that we exist um so I, th that, I, th that, I think that's important more, and I think the yeah. more that people see of us and actually meet us and work with us, the more they realise we're often talking common sense because we all want to see a better service and we all understand that if working people are treated well, foster carers in your case, if they're treated well, it, the service will be better and that's what we all want to see. Yeah, the uh, other way we're doing it is we're going via the local, the local authorities by law are supposed to have a foster care association. So we're contacting the foster care associations to go and do face-to-face -face meetings. We've been Zoom meetings for the past couple of months, but because really we only got our trade union status in August. So, so yeah, it's an, uh, and, an and have, go at the moment. Robin, have you affiliated to the TUC? Not as yet, but I've already taken down Frances's details. I couldn't find her on LinkedIn, but I found the TUC. So, Good. and I've got the website. Fantastic. So, yeah. 
Contact you see, us. You she, might have gained a new member. <laughs> well, you see, th- this is what we're all about, getting the TUC <laughs> more, radio, more members. It. Well, exactly, Robin. <laughs> she'll, she'll come back after this one. Um, now, Pete, in, in our efforts to crowdfund a slogan for your increasing <laughs> membership, Pete has come up with another one in Tewkesbury. He says, unite for a voice. Well, I can see one problem with that. <laughs> it might be a little bit confusing. It <laughs> might just, Mind you, you can get Unite to pay for the whole I campaign, think Sharon couldn't Graham you? might be interested in that one. <laughs> well done, Pete. Right, let's go to Alex in Croydon. Alex, hi, what would you like to ask? Oh, uh, hi. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yeah, more or less. What would you like to say? Um, I'm a member of another union, and I just learned today that the, this other union um, were furloughing their cleaning staff. I work in a school as a cleaner, and the, the cleaners were being furloughed. Is, is, is that Furlough's finished, sort? doesn't it? How can they be furloughed? Uh, what, you mean under the government's furlough pa- scheme in the pandemic? Yeah. That, that yeah. scheme doesn't exist anymore. OK. But I just just wanted to get information uh, or to confirm this information that, f- that the cleaners were being furloughed or mm. had been furloughed. Might, might be worth just... Pandemic. Might be worth just getting in touch with the union and asking them if if it's something you're interested in. I'd encourage you to you know look them up on the website. Every every website has a contact um, uh, number and a contact email, and just or get in touch with the rep and ask them. Okay. All right. OK, Alex, thank you very much. Uh, Terry in Wakefield says, uh, what can I do if my employer doesn't recognise a union? I work in the media. Mm. Well, it's a shame that they don't recognise a union. And, uh, of course, there is a legal route that unions can go through to get that recognition. Uh, but I recognise sometimes you're in that in-between stage where there's a few of you uh, who are members and you're trying to build up that membership uh, so you know again I'm very sensitive to the fact that sometimes in some areas people don't want to shout th- about being a member of a union because of that worry that was spoken about before of an employer picking on somebody although they'd be in trouble with the law if they did mm. um, but I think it is that kind of issue of trying to build up the presence the more that you talk to your workmates and encourage people to join the more likely the employer is to listen and of course in some places when we're in that in-between stage we get employers who are prepared to talk to us about some issues at least like health and safety at work or you know equalities um, and that's like a kind of foot in the door because maybe they sometimes need to realise we don't have two horns, we're practical people who just want to make working lives better. Uh, thank you very much for that, Terry. Let's go to John in Edinburgh. Hello, John. Hi there. How are you doing, Ian? Um, thanks for taking the call. And hi, Francis. And hi, um, John. I really, hi. I really like what you've been saying tonight. Um, I just wanted to ask, that I don't know if it's an easy question to answer, so apologies, but I was wondering if there's any way to depoliticise, apologies, the, um, the way the unions work. And the reason I ask, just to kind of contextualise it, is that I, I live in, in Scotland, Edinburgh, mm. and I, for the last oh, seven years, haven't voted Labour, I voted um, SNP, and one of the reasons that I've done that is that I was a big supporter of Equal Pay for Women um, in our councils, uh, a member of COSLA. And in Glasgow, we had a situation, um, so not too far from where I am just now, where that the council had not been paying uh, women equally for the roles that they were doing. And at the time, that was knocked back by Richard Leonard, um, who was then in charge of what was happening there, who then went on to be leader of the Scottish Labour Party. Mm. And it ended up being under the SNP government that they ended up paying women equally. And uh, uh, Glasgow Council, which is now SNP, is really struggling for cash as a, as a result. But the unions, by and large, are still really Labour-centric. And I find it a really strange situation, which is maybe not across the whole country. I appreciate it's mm. a different situation in Scotland. But there's this huge divide where the unions are so entrenched in Labour 
that even when Labour does something wrong, which that really, really was, not being women equally and the leader of the Labour Party being implicit in that, mm. so wrong that you can't move away from it. And I wonder what your opinion is on how that can be resolved. Mm. Well, it's, it's, you know, ov- obviously we represent all unions. People sometimes forget that the majority of the unions um, in this country are not affiliated to any party. Um, but obviously some of the big ones uh, in particular are. You know, and, um, and those links go back generations. But I think unions are sensitive to the fact that Again, while the evidence is that uh, union members are still more likely to vote Labour than average. um, Are they? They are. They're still a marker. Because if you look at the last election result, 47% of working class people voted Conservative, 32% voted Labour. I'm talking about union members. Uh, So there is a marker. People are aware of the values, aware of... Uh, you know, their union's recommendation and so on. But I think unions are sensitive to the fact, whether they're affiliated to Labour or not, that we have people uh, from all political persuasions in our membership, mainstream political parties in our membership, including, of course, um, the SNP and the Conservative Party and every other, you know, mainstream party. And so, you know, people... I think the way that we resolve it for me anyway, is about a really strong focus on our priorities for working people. And, you know, certainly from a TUC perspective, we try and knock on the doors of politicians, whoever's in government, we want that fair hearing. So in Scotland, of course, that would be the SNP. You've got a very able leader uh, who I'm sure you'll know, Ros Foyer, leader of the STUC. My goodness me, is she effective in opening doors um, and putting our case and equal pay for work of equal value. We, goodness me, 21st century, we're still fighting to get equal pay for women. Um, you know, is going to be one of the things that we really care about. And again, regardless of the colour of the government in power, We've got to put our case for a fair deal for working people. So, you know, as a union member, as you know, as well as me, every union member gets a vote. Every union member gets to decide who represents them in the union. Um, You know, we're democratic organisations. And in the end, we have to go with the majority decision and decide which union we want. John, quick word from you. No, I think that's a really, I, I think that's a really fair answer, Francis. I, I, I know it's not an easy question to answer. Mm. I think so. It change very quickly. I just think, I think the problem is not so much the unions. I think the political parties are head banging so much of the time, and we're looking at that cyclical nature: four years only, five mm. years at most, and the unions go on. You, you mentioned yourself; it's generations, but. Mm. We have to, I, I don't think that's, I think something in the union, union leadership needs to be cognizant of that, of that and, and actually push that, say, look, we, we're not beholden to you. Mm. We, we're actually stronger than you as a political party in many respects. And we need to be able to say, you know, if, if you're not going to do it for us anymore, we will move here. We will move there. And I feel that that's maybe what's been lacking okay. a little bit. But, no, I really appreciate you taking the time to answer. No, John, to talk to you. thank you very much indeed for your call. We'll be back with more calls in just a second. It's 8.47. This is LBC.
Leading Britain's conversation. Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. It's ten to nine. Karen Kehoe on Twitter says, if I were to list the women my children should listen to, apart from me, Frances O'Grady is top of the list. Common sense, compassion and a cool head. Absolutely love her. Are, are you aware of being a bit of a female role model? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, you are, because, no. I mean, you inevitably are by the position that you hold. I tell you what, I get huge encouragement from women and men, because you'll know any any job any leadership job in any walk of life can be sometimes you know you have your highs and you have your lows well you're there to be shot at aren't you basically sometimes yeah. and I, you know i really do appreciate that encouragement because we are all human mm. and um yeah and sometimes well that's a revelation trade union leaders <laughs> human <laughs> Shock horror. Right. Um, Jacob in Clapham says, Usdor have declined to comment on IKEA and others reducing sick pay for mm. unvaccinated workers, as was reported by Andrew Pierce on LBC last week. Is this what a union should be doing? Um, now, you can't expect Francis to slag off one of our member unions, but that does seem a bit odd. I think it's, um, you know, I think we're all aware people have got really strong views, and certainly I definitely would encourage everybody to get vaccinated and boosted but we also know that some people are absolutely ideologically opposed to it you know conspiracy theories in my view and all of that and then there are people who just need support and encouragement and I have to say I was so disappointed to see organizations like Next and Ikea thinking that they could somehow bash people into getting vaccinated rather than doing their best to make it as easy as possible, providing the encouragement and support, paid time off, whatever it takes to encourage people to get the jab, but not hitting them over the head, because I think it will be counterproductive but in the I, end. I suppose the point Jacob is making is that um, a, an unvaccinated person is paying exactly the same union dues as a vaccinated person, so therefore they deserve equal representation. Well, uh you know, I haven't seen who said what on this, but I know what I'm saying as, you know, in terms of the TUC is that I don't think it's the right way to achieve what I think we're very clear is the best thing to happen, which is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. But if you cut people's contractual sick pay, it could have the opposite effect. And what's worse is that I think they're going to be even more reluctant to self-isolate when they mm. should. You know, and actually the imperative for me is making sure that we try and slow that transmission of the virus, keep people safe. I mean, without commenting on the rights and wrongs of it, shouldn't they actually, at least if, they, if they're not going to do anything, shouldn't they be publicly commenting and defending why they're not doing something? Well, like I say, I, I'm saying that on behalf of the okay. trade union movement. Um, another take, I won't get, get you to comment on this one, but it has come in saying, I'm a member of the Conservative Party and I work in retail. Why are us doors so weak that people are abandoning them? Because because of their increased fees, will never vote Labour. Well, as I say, that's it's not really Francis's job to comment on an individual union, so I'll save you from and that well, one, unless you want to comment. Well, I'm not sure it's correct, actually, because I think, um, you know, Usdor has done an incredible job, particularly through this pandemic. All of us have all have gone into shops, you know, when, um, when we've had those first restrictions come in, and I was looking into the eyes of mainly women sat on those desks who look terrified um, and you know making sure the work that Paddy Lillis the leader of Usdor did with the retail consortium make keeping his members safe keeping all shop workers safe was absolutely incredible they've done some great deals recently uh, winning a minimum 10 pounds an hour uh, they fought off far and rehire they've you know done some incredible work as door and um you know again i think we all have to share the responsibility that we've got to join our unions get involved in our unions because we're democratic okay. organizations right david is in enfield hello david good evening good evening francis good evening we we have met we talked a couple of months ago on ian's program i don't even remember i called him with a question about uh, Boris Johnson being a great marketer, but not a great uh, Prime Minister. <laughs> it, it was a highlight of Francis, <laughs> even, Francis <laughs> e Evening, David. What's your question this time? OK, it's a big, big issue tonight. Um, 
Francis, real wages for the average worker yeah. and his payroll wages have stagnated since yeah. 2007. There's been no effect uh, wage growth uh, following the financial crisis and 10 years of austerity. And now, just as it looked like we may see some recovery in nominal wages, the inflation rate is taking off 5.4% in December. Factory prices up 13%. So that's not a good uh, harbinger of things to come. Um, uh, my question, I've got two questions for you. If, if you were Chancellor, what would you do to safeguard incomes in the next uh, yep. 12 months for, for, for the average worker? And secondly, what are you doing to develop all these highly skilled, high-wage jobs the Prime Minister is promising? Yeah, well, bang on, David, because these are the big questions that face us because, you know, working families are getting hammered at the moment. And what's worse, we've still got those tax hikes to come, the national insurance increase. So as well as inflation, as well as universal credit being cut, as well as uh, real wages being predicted to fall this year on average, uh, there's worse to come. So I would like to see the Chancellor boosting the national minimum wage, which is nearly a pound an hour below what uh, the Living Wage Foundation says should be the real living wage that you can actually raise a family on and survive on. Uh, so we need a boost, a proper boost in the minimum wage. We need to recognise that giving key workers, all those brilliant NHS staff, not just the nurses and doctors, but all the support staff, um, education workers, civil service, giving them a wage boost will help boost our economy because modestly paid workers spend their money in the local economy in shops and businesses and that goes into other people's wage packets so if we're going to lift uh, growth then we need to lift working people we need to level up work um, so that's really important and I'd like to see the government acknowledge that trade unions in any democratic country have a critical role to play in sharing power a bit. Because, you know, I, I think people have, we've seen what happened with top pay, we've seen what's happened with dividend payouts. Everybody knows that inequality is getting worse and that's damaging all of us. We've got to get, I'd like to see a bit more of a solidarity society, recognising we all depend on each other just as we did okay. during the pandemic. Um, David said, imagine you're Chancellor. Would, would, you, would, you, <laughs> would you ever stand for Parliament? Lots of trade union no. leaders have done over the years. <laughs> no, I made my choice a long time ago that um, I was a union rep, uh, you know, in terms of family pressures and stuff, that, that was my priority that I I suppose I took satisfaction from whoever's in government week by week you can still make a difference and you know I do have values I do have my own kind of principles about the sort of society I would like to see but I'm also a very practical person who likes to get things done. Okay David thank you for your question. Uh, final question from James in Watford. Hi James. Oh, good evening. Um, my question is um, in uh, 2022, um, how can uh, unions go about representing their members when their members have such different interests? They're from such different backgrounds, uh, different opinions, different salary scales, all sorts of. I mean, how do you get a collective when there's such diversity in the membership? That is a brilliant question, James. And, um, you know, it is true that the world of work has changed. We've got many more smaller workplaces, uh, different sorts of contracts, you know, many more divisions in many ways. And, and actually, again, I sort of worry from a big picture point of view about that sort of atomization, what that means for society. But, you know, I hope people will tune in online to our Congress, because that's our you know, workers' parliament, if you like. And you see people, you know, airline pilots on decent pay, mm. uh, cleaners and porters on not brilliant pay and everything in between. And yet we find this common cause together as working people and we share aims and work together and learn from each other. And so there's something for me pretty wonderful about that, about finding that common cause. Like I say, whatever background we come from, increasingly diverse trade union movement. Uh, you know, I... 
I find something inspiring about that and I think it's important for society. Okay, James, thank you very much. So have you enjoyed the last hour? Is it gone? It's gone, I'm afraid. I've, yeah. Well, then I've definitely enjoyed it. You're about it. to be replaced by <laughs> Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin on the airwaves. <laughs> um, look, we would love to have you back again a little bit later in the year because I, th- I think we've had a lot of nice comments on the, on the last hour and what you've been saying. So hopefully you'll come back a little bit later in yeah, 2022. Yeah, well, I've... In, thank you very much for the invitation and I've really enjoyed talking to your callers. And if you've missed any of this, we will put it up on uh, YouTube tomorrow because I don't think we were streaming it live, but uh, uh, people have really enjoyed it, Francis. Thank you very thank much you. In, indeed. Um, right, in the next hour, we are going to be talking about the fact that UK's President Vladimir Zelensky has hit back at comments made by his US counterpart Joe Biden about a minor incursion by Russia into his country. Biden has suggested that a minor attack might bring a weaker response from the US and its allies. Is Joe Biden the new Neville Chamberlain? 0345 6060 973. It's one minute past nine. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock... The Prime Minister has denied claims government whips are using extreme tactics to stop a vote of no confidence against him.